So aquatic animals are those that live underwater. There's a vast variety of aquatic creatures with unique characteristics that live within salt water, like the ocean, or in fresh water, like rivers, lakes, and ponds. This morning, I'm not sure why, but we're getting an open, close, and personal look with a few of these animals that we would swim really far from if we saw them into the water because we would fade. Anyway, here they are. Chances are, you've seen a few in movies. They can also be fried, curried, stewed, steamed, or prepared in any way that pleases your taste buds. But do you have all the facts about these aquatic creatures? Let's dive into the underwater world. Here are seven fun facts about aquatic animals. Number one, fish are gill-bearing aquatic craniate animals that lack limbs with digits. But did you know that there are over 30,000 species of fish? Yes! They come in different shapes, colors, sizes, and can be found in the sea, ocean, and river. Some popular fish that you might already know, tuna, salmon, and shark. Number two, the land of ackee and saltfish. Did you know that Jamaica has its own species of fish swimming around its shores? Well, now you do. Fish that can be found in our waters include kingfish, jack, barracuda, mackerel, bonita, and tuna. Number three, are you a seafood lover? Great! Fish are extremely nutritious and highly enriched in calcium and iron. But although healthy, not all fish are a treat to eat, as they are actually poisonous. Some of the world's most poisonous fish are the pufferfish, lionfish, piranha, and tigerfish, with the most venomous being the reef stonefish. When disturbed, it doesn't swim away, but instead erects 13 venomous spines along its back. Number four. In the murky black waters of the peat swamp forest of Southeast Asia lives the world's smallest fish, the dwarf minnow of the genus Pediocypris. This extreme environment, characterized by low oxygen and high acidity, is the home of several miniaturized fish species. Number five, let's admit it. Most of us at some point had a pet fish. And even though the lifespan of our pet fish was a little short, some fish can actually live for a long time. Some fish can even outlive humans. One of the oldest living fish was the Australian longfish. In 2003, it was still alive and well at 65 years old. Number six, some fish are larger than life, literally. The Rhynchodon typos, or whale shark, is the biggest fish in the ocean. You can't always judge a book by its cover. And despite their enormous size and intimidating appearance, whale sharks are commonly delicate and approachable. Well, sort of. Whale sharks may grow up to 40 feet and weigh as much as 40 tons by some estimates. It is unknown how long they can live. However, some scientists believe that they can live approximately 60 to 100 years. Number seven. Fish aren't only bound to water. Some actually come up on land for a little fresh air. There are some species of fish that can live up to three days on land or even more and can breathe air and absorb oxygen through their skins. The mudskippers are found in the mangrove swamps in Africa and Indo-Pacific and spend 90% of their time on land. There you have it. That's seven fun facts about aquatic animals. So next time you see them in a movie or on your dinner table, you'll know all the facts about these aquatic animals. Thank you for sharing that. Exotic animals imported. What's the danger? We're sticking to the theme of animals when we come back after this break. We'll be right back.
So in July of this year, the Gleaner reported that the St. James Health Department had launched an investigation into alleged sightings of roaming monkeys. Also reports have surfaced of monkeys and other exotic animals being spotted in sections of St. James and St. Elizabeth. Um, they've been labeled a potential health risk. And joining us this morning are NEPA's environmental officer responsible for the ecosystems management branch, Ricardo Miller, and Damian White, <laughs> terrestrial biologist and graduate student at UWI. And I'm laughing because every time Damian come on the show, and bring a guest, me and Simone just cannot. Just cannot. make sure, Damon, can you just declare up front that you don't have anything that would creep us out, please? Only must say the only must say my Jamaican crocodile shirt. Okay, nothing, okay, nothing, okay. Nothing. We can uh, work with that. All right. We can work with that. Ricardo, I'm going to start with you because they're exotic animals, and one would ask, how did they get to Jamaica in the first place? How does well, one import an exotic animal? Well, there's a legal way, and of course there is an illegal way, um, but we haven't had any recent applications for importation of things like monkeys, which you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. But there's a legal route where you would apply through NEPA and through the Veterinary Services Division if you're interested in bringing an, a species that is a species of animals that is not known or um, not a, a resident in Jamaica. So well, what would I have to, to say? To, I mean, do I just say, listen, I want to bring a, a rare animal and I, and, and I get the permit? Or do I have to say, OK, I'm bringing a rare animal. Do I have to show that I am going to be able to take care of the animal and, and things like that? OK, so it's, it's, it is not as straightforward as it might seem, because a lot of these animals are actually protected under international laws. And the main one we're, we're dealing with here is the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, the CITES. Um, that's the CITES Convention. And Jamaica being a signatory to CITES means that there is an extra step to go about importing species that are listed on the CITES. Monkeys are listed on the CITES, uh, many bird species, and many species that are endangered. So the, the whole goal of CITES is to regulate the trade of species that are considered endangered. In some instances, they prohibit trade if, if the situation is dire. And in some cases, they have quotas um, for these. So the first thing you as an applicant would do is contact NEPA so we have an idea exactly what it is you want to import. Sometimes people have a local name for it, but in actuality, we, we prefer to work with the scientific name in that way, there is no ambiguity as to what we're dealing with. And once we, we get that, we now look into whether this species requires a CITES permit for it to be imported into the island. So, uh, we also look at the purpose you want it for. Um, if it is something that is common in the pet trade, for example, we simply require that you can prove, you know, that you'll be taking care of the animal in a, in a proper way. That's like and a what, Ricardo? Like a what would be common in this pit? So yeah, if I want to bring in a dog, a rare dog? Like... <laughs> well, a dog, well, we, we, we don't look at dogs because those are, are more domesticated animals. But we're talking about, um, there are certain species of birds, for example, uh -huh. that they may be, they may want to, to, you know, import into the island. And again, we collaborate with the veterinary services division because in many cases, some of these um, especially birds are totally restricted. So there are there are people who want to bring in pet snakes, you know, and of course that will actually have to go through NEPA as well, and we look into exactly what it is. Um, and of course there are laws that are there to restrict um, entry of some groups of animals. Okay. So so Damien, when you listen to this, right? I mean, this monkey story is one thing. Um, what are some of the more exotic? animals you've seen that have made their way here, imported here, and what really is the risk? When, when we say there's a health risk, what could the risk possibly be? All right, let's, let's think of it. So, I mean, maybe 20 years ago, um, you get up in the morning in Kingston and you used to hear normal yellow bill parrot or black bill parrot. I know people are hearing exotic parrots flying around. One is the yellow nape and we have the ring nape parakeet. Now, these birds um, love the pets. However, the ringneck parakeet is a big agricultural problem in a number of countries. In Barbados right now, you hear about like a flock of them going into some of the um, um, field. 
and they flocks of maybe two, four hundred birds. Wow. Now we are seeing the flocks of these birds flying around in Kingston. Risk that it um, that runs now. One, you see, because when they came here, whether they came in the legal or the illegal route, there are own people and there are another um, other set of animals which they weren't naturally around. So their chances are disease coming in with the birds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How it impacts us? We have three Amazon, three parrots, we could call it. That's a Jamaican parakeet, the black bill parakeet, the yellow bill, which are found nowhere else in the world. So imagine these birds coming over and have a disease. It would come and wipe out our population. Think about the agriculture. Um, people might start blaming our local birds that they are um, destroying the crops. So that's one example. We have cases uh, where you're here now in Portland, we have the reindeer. It is good that... Yeah, um, hold on. When... Breaks, breaks, breaks. Yes. So Rudolph <laughs> is in Portland? Yeah, man. Rudolph then how, it, how, how Rudolph reached to Portland, please? Well, that's another interesting thing. I mean, there was a case during um, Hurricane Gilbert, a touristic facility there. Um, they got away. They were in the forest. And one day a farmer walked around and he said, see Bambi. So they think it's a rolling calf or something because imagine in Jamaica you see a reindeer. Wait, you, you'd believe you see a reindeer? No. And now we have um, cases where this animal, um, a carrot farmer was telling me that he had about two acres of carrots, about $2 million or more worth of carrot, and ready to reap, and the animals go there and eat it all up. Mm. So eat it all up. Rudolph love carrots? Mm. Yeah. We have other, yeah, that's Rudolph there. Wow. And we have other examples. Um, right now, everybody hear about the Cuban tree frog, which might have come in as a throwaway, but in some countries, um, people have them as pet. And I'm not saying they came here during the pet trade, but I'm giving you examples of exotic coming here, getting away for a she beautiful a island, breeding up. And one might come by your door and jump on you where you know you don't have a heart attack. No, no. <laughs> but the, the point what we are trying to make here is that we have a set of rules and regulation here. And people might think it's unfair, but it has to go through the process because imagine there is a, you, you might think about yourself, oh, I'm carrying this lovely exotic snake. I bring you in an anaconda. Well, I think anacondas are cute. But anacondas um, will do well in Jamaica and would start eating your pets. So we have to do the risk analysis in checking one, um, if the disease, if it has um, certain kind of disease. Two, if it gets away, what is the risk to our environment? Because most of our animals here has evolved in our environment. Mm -hmm. That's why you will never see high numbers of them. And when some of these come to Jamaica and a paradise, come on the beach and the food, they will um, reproduce rapidly. Like our, like our friends our from, um, like our creature friends from, you know where, the green ones, right? Right. Are, yes, they, are but... they still doing their thing down there in... In, in, in Cayman? Oh, man. Here they or came. here? Well, that's the reason why we come on programs like this. So, um, you see, there are a few scientists, you know, like Ricard and me in Jamaica. But we have more people. So, we do stuff like this. So, if people see something odd, they will contact us and, you know, tell us that it's here. Yeah. So, like the green iguana now, that's on the pet trade. And we know that people might try to move it illegally. And the thing is, when you move this stuff illegally, you don't check for um, disease. You don't check for the invasiveness. So you might wake up five, ten years um, from now and you're like in Miami, where you know you see iguana run up and down, Bind or you time. see Bind. in Cayman. So I that's why it. that's the danger of stuff like that. Ricardo, I want to bring in before we go, what happens, sure. um, two things, what happens when the sightings, do people contact you, and, and when you retrieve the animals, what happens to the animal? Oh, so when, when there are sightings of exotic animals in the wild, or sometimes even at ports of entry, we, we have animals coming in, in in containers inadvertently. In cases like that, for example, the, the veterinary service division is contacted and they have their protocols that they actually use. In many cases, the animals are put down because there is that risk that Damien just mentioned that is mm -hmm. we, we're not certain of, for example, the, the introduction of diseases and so forth. Um, in, in some cases, we may bring it to a rescue facility where the animal can be housed and can, you know, can live out the rest of its life if we think the risk of the animal is low. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in many instances, the animals are actually put down. Wow. Okay. And wow. is there like a, is there an, a, 
accountability measure in place? Like if you import an animal that's not supposed to be here, are you fined? Are you? Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, so if, if we can actually prove that it was importation, no, that, that will fall under our Endangered Species Act, which is our local law here for that CITES convention I mentioned. And that deals with international trade. And the fine can be up to $2 million for that or a year in prison. Mm -hmm. And you can also, you know, be charged under the Local Wildlife Protection Act. And that is up to 12 years, um, sorry, 12 months imprisonment or up to $100,000. Okay. Um, but the, the stiffer penalties for the international trade. All right. All so right. if you're thinking of bringing in a... What's your name? Exotic animal. Check with Nepa. A Japanese fowl. A what? Japanese fowl. They can't eat? No. <laughs> They're not fowl. Look yeah. here, so... But what an eating fowl. Is that what kind of fowl? It's a feeding. Pretty fowl. Is that what fowl? A pretty fowl. Let's then... use the nice sense. You want him in the yard, look pretty, so yeah. That's so they pretty they fowl. are people really eating the reindeer? Yeah, yes. they're jerking them, man. Go down there, man. They're jerking them. They're um, cooking manish water. Hurry. <gasps> Boy, I tell you, if people were calling me about reindeer, you'd be surprised. And mm. I have to care for me for a lot of people. Just a little bit more gamey than goat, you know. But you'll enjoy it, trust me. Like you'll a bit enjoy. more what? Gamey. Gamey. Uh. You know, them use this word gamey. Or right, let me put it a little bit more raw. I have a little bit more raw taste. Yeah, we're well, good. Goat. Great. Thanks, Damien. Oh. So good to talk it. to you. Bye. Damien, um, Damien yeah. just made me Bye. vegan, man. Great to have you. Bro. You see, poor Rudolph was just pulling Santa's sleigh, buck up in a Jamaica, and has now become gamey meat. I, I'm sorry, Rudolph. I'm behalf of all Jamaica. I'm behalf of all the children around the world. <sighs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Nepal's environment and all of They're responsible for the ecosystems management branch. Ricardo Miller and a friend, Damien White, terrestrial biologist and graduate student at the University of the West Indies. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate you. And thank you for being here this morning. Save the, save the, save the crocs. Save the Jamaican crocs. They love you. Save the reindeer, too. We love them from afar, too. Not, not Damien. Damien loved them from an ear. Listen, people, stop importing the things. And please, do not, do not, do not, do not bring the iguana. Do you know your phobias? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. After the break, we highlight a few. With